Hello, welcome, and my name is Richard Miller. I'm traveling in Australia. This is my first week, and uh, so many things are opening up, and such a beautiful land, and I'd say such a beautiful people. I mean, the, the ones I'm seeing, at least, I'm really enjoying, and uh, without saying too much, I'll just say that uh, Peter and April came to, to visit, came down to visit where I am here, and so please help me welcome Peter. Hi, Peter. Hi there. We just only met. True. You know, sometimes in the spiritual search, we have a great feel for silence. And I, I feel your silence. It's the loudest silence. <laughs> it's very penetrating and very comforting, actually. It's been a good part of 20 years or so looking for silence. And the timing of it wasn't up to me, but the timing of it eventually happened to a point where silence became who I am. I like to speak and converse with people and relate and communicate sometimes, but I'm always left with my silence. That's the very thing that most people are frightened of, is their own inactivity, their own silence, their own stillness, their own profound depth of simply and only being where they are this moment. It almost brings tears to my eyes when you say fear of our own inactivity. And I can really feel that, you know. It feels like I have to get somewhere for so long in my life. My memory is that. And I've made every kind of excuse and love of so many kinds of projects and so many kinds of activities. And even now, I suppose, I'm trying to put this, this wisdom together in a way where it includes activity. I'm trying to justify so much that activity and silence are not exclusive. And that actually silence brings a new and more appropriate activity. Well, silence and activity are not exclusive. When you're in a state of activity or heightened experience, let's say, there's a certain momentum that drives that experience. A certain wanting to achieve something, to do something in particular, to work something out. There's some momentum behind the experience or the drive to complete or develop something, let's say, is the very thing that blocks the stillness. If we get on a treadmill and like you said we think we're going somewhere by doing a particular thing in our life whatever that is whether it's being a meditator or being an active business person or whoever we want to be so it's the momentum that always keeps us ahead of ourselves always just one or two steps in front of where we actually are ultimately they become one and the same experience Because stillness is part of activity and activity is part of stillness. They're one and the same. Being seen with a brain that's clear and uncluttered. We may choose to be still and yet our life might demand that we need to be highly active. We all have that experience. And then a resistance comes up where we don't necessarily want to be active, but our life drives us forward to achieve and do things. So stillness, when we have the time to be still, in a more traditional way, like being able to meditate and have some quiet time, 
we all love to have quiet time if we do. Because the quiet time helps us reflect on what drives us, what keeps us away from being who we really are. What comes to me is that when we think we have to create our own activity, cognate it, decide on it, choose it, then that keeps us away from stillness. But I believe there could be just a flow of activity that many times is just in the moment. Uh, what don't they say that uh, uh, in business, thing. just in the moment, a a delivery, right? So that means you can't have it before you actually need it or before it's there. And, and that, that forced doing is the antithesis of stillness. Well, as the expression goes, go with the flow. We're always going with the flow, but we don't necessarily want to because we have another agenda in our mind. It's flowing the wrong way. So the flow is <laughs> always in the now, right? <laughs> right. But we want to step outside the now because we're in a hurry, because we're impatient, because we're desirous and incomplete. So there's many different qualities that the mind has, both positively and negatively, that keep us allured with the future, to keep us tethered to the future, or remembering the past. What is that impatience? It's the desire to exist separately as a persona that wants something particularly for itself. Could it be that part of the impatience is the re is the kind of, I could say recognition, but let's just say the belief in a pattern. And I know there's some intermediary steps in this pattern, and then there's a wave, to, and then there's some place I want to be, and I want to jump over the the intermediate steps of just relaxing or something and I want to go for what I think is my my goal. And so then that would cause impatience because I want to jump over what's happening now and get to the good part. And how do I know there's a good part? I mean, it's just my imagined idea that I live in a pattern. You know there's a good part because you can feel it now. <laughs> when there's a gap in your attention, when your mind is drive to want to be somewhere else. So your heart or your being or your fullness as a spiritual character or being is always underlying every other step or every other pattern or every other belief that we ever have ever had. But the patterns are enormously strong because they're like they block the river flowing where it's always flowing. So the river's always flowing now. The patterns want to tell us the river's flowing somewhere else, somewhere else. Because the future is so enticing. Because there's apparently so much to do. Some place to go. Some place where we can rest and our mind tells us it's in the future. That's why we're so driven and we can't relax and just experience fully the now as it is in its simplicity and it's quietness. And there's nothing to do and nowhere to go. And that's in truth all enlightenment is. It's like an ongoing recognition or an uninterrupted recognition that there's nowhere else to go but to be where our body and our life eternally resides. So is that pattern imaginary? There is Imagine, no pattern, right? Imagination is the greatest impediment to enlightenment. In the relative world, we need our imagination to function practically and to do things practically. And our imagination put us on the moon. Our imagination created this fantastic technology that we experience today. So imagination is a plus side, a very positive side, when we need to use our imagination to create. It's a creative tool. But when we need to switch it off like a light switch, we have to learn how to switch the light switch off to transcend our imagination and just relax behind our imagination and just be where we are. 
So imagination definitely has a purpose. It's also an impediment because it's the thing that drives us on. It drives us forward into our experience, consciously into our experience, into more and more experience. Because we imagine somehow it's better where we're going than where we are. So ultimately, imagination is the thing that creates our dualistic world. If we don't imagine and we don't think, where is this dualistic world? It doesn't exist. There's only an absolute level of reality which we call now, life now, being now. Earlier on we were talking about momentum, kind of the momentum of maybe a wandering attention, attention that roves and looks for something that we think we want, or an intention that seeks to identify a pattern, let's say. And I was wondering if there's a distinction between the momentum and the motivation. Motivation popped in my mind, and I didn't know exactly why, but the motivation to do all that, to be searching and, and using our attention to cast, a, cast about. And well, momentum in the relative sense of being in the world is absolutely essential. We need a certain amount of this quality to survive. Like the momentum of the life force? The momentum of the body. The body's created in time, it's driven by time and experience and conditioning. And the body has to live out its own karmic circumstance through our sexuality, through our living experience, through our mental world, through our emotional self. Our body, by being born into time, that has an 80 year, let's say, lifespan, our body has much to do, or it thinks it has much to do, and our brain is conditioned to believe we have much to do, to go out there into life and make something of our life. And relatively, this is so. But being a spiritual being is diametrically different. We're not driven out there by our brain and our intentions and our ideas and our imaginations and our thoughts. We're drawing back, back into a quieter, more sublime pace or space inside. It's a different quest that has its own momentum. There's definitely a momentum in the spiritual search, as most people find out who are spiritually orientated. But the momentum has changed direction, it's gone inside, investigating the inner workings of the mind and the emotions and the, and the body, rather than being driven out there into the external or the apparent external existence, where there's everything and everything going on, constantly. The world, the news, the media, the politicians, the greed, the confusion, it's all going on. The masses and masses of information are given and we're, our brain is ingesting masses of information from the past, from our conditioning, and from whatever we recognise and witness through the news and the media today. We're enthralled by it. If we watch the news, if we dare watch the news, we're enthralled by what's happening next, aren't we? Some people don't watch the news. We're probably the wisest of all. But our human condition demands that we are inquisitive by nature. We want to know what's going on around us. We want to know what's going on in the world because our hearts care. We can't stop collectively what's going on, but our hearts care enough to want to be informed about the destiny of the world and the momentum of the world and where the world's heading. But eventually, once we become destined to be truly spiritual, we have to learn slowly, slowly to shut off that world, and shut off that momentum and close our eyes and simply reside into a relaxed state of being again. Easier said than done.
You know, when you said we truly care, we truly care about the conditions of the world and the conditions of the animal world and plant world and, and the conditions of the planet and the conditions of the different nations and societies and races. We truly care. And if we do care, shouldn't they be honored with some of our attention? If we just take our attention away from them, I'm not saying the news is a correct source of uh, creating attention, but maybe nowadays there's many sources. And if we are, you know, I'm not saying that we should st stress out uh, reciprocally with others, and I'm not saying that we should join their fight and say that, okay, there's a war on injustice or something like that, because somehow that's... Uh, it's strange to have a, a war which is unjust and say it's on injustice. I mean, how can you have an, one injustice doesn't cancel another? And, uh, but well, somebody it, Richard has to save the whales. Somebody has to protest against the war in Afghanistan or in Iraq or wherever it is. Somebody has to have enough heart and enough compassion to take action and publicly state how they feel. As a collective group of people around the world, more and more we're going to see more and more protests, people in the streets, particularly in America at the moment, in Europe, where there's a crisis going on. People are going to demand some justice. But ultimately the justice is not out there in the world. You know, the people have to follow those causes and speak their mind because their feelings demand that they do something against what's going on in the name of the world, the money world, the financial world, the political world with all its lies and injustice. But in the end, it's our world and our brain and our heart is where the real imbalance lies. And while we have imbalance in our own psyche, in our own body and mind, constantly we're going to project that and see that outside ourselves as injustice or imbalance or as a situation that's not very agreeable, not very positive, not very accurate. But I admire people to go out on boats and save the whales and put their bodies on the line and demonstrate I admire those people, because somebody has to do it. They're putting their lives on the line for something that they believe in. And while we hold a belief system in our mind that's important to us, we have to follow that. It means becoming a demonstrator, an act, a social activist. That's what we need to do. Until we see through that and we go look a little deeper and look to see where the real cause is. What's the causation of my unhappiness, my imbalance, my lack of seeing. What blinds me from simply seeing the beauty of life again in its fullness and its simplicity. You know, even logically, it's it, uh, just on the, on the mental, in the mental apparatus, it's easy to see the logic of what's wrong in the world is a reflection of me and somehow I have those same hostilities that I see outside. But sometimes it's hard to really relate to where those are or how they show up, you know, because of, I think, uh, certain belief structures. That, but anyhow, just to, uh, I'll tell you how I what I think maybe in a minute, but I want to just note, note that, that it's hard to, that we need some kind of help to see it. And because you said, if you really look inside, you, all problems will be resolved by a true seeing. So then how can I see that I'm guilty of all those things that, I mean, I can think of a few examples actually, but what, how can we be helped to kind of see that, not only just say it as words, but somehow feel it, feel feel the same remorse that those people are feeling or see. I'm not saying we should feel guilt. I don't know what I'm saying. I'm just saying no in a, tr in, in a deeper way that uh, we are the world 
and it includes everything. Well, we are the earth. I don't know the way the world, because we didn't create the world. As a collective consciousness, we all had our part to play. But you look at the natural world, the earth, the birds and the trees and the, the green grass and the beautiful smells and the divine nature of everything that we can perceive through our human brain and our perceptive ability. That's who we really are. We are earth consciousness. We're earthlings, like one of my teachers used to say. But we've become technocrats. We've become technological junkies. We follow the media if we do and we watch the news at our own peril because it sets up more belief systems day by day as the news gets worse or apparently gets worse globally. But to me, I see it in a totally positive light because basically, collectively, the world has to get worse, must get worse before it gets better because the pus has to come out. The greed and the delusion and the basis upon which the world is being created has to crumble and it will crumble. Sometimes we wonder if the world is elastic enough to get wor much worse because there's some pretty fearsome things happening. Well, let me tell you, I'm not a doomsday person really, but the world will get worse, it'll get much worse because we have to be shocked into wanting to seek something which is more meaningful and truthful. Unless we're shocked, it's like being told we have cancer from a doctor. It happens every day to somebody around the world, every second. They're told they have cancer or some terminal illness. And that shocks them into either experiencing a period of time, so many months or years before they die, and realising many things before that death comes physically. Or it means that they have to have a big turnaround and look in the mirror and realise what the basis of what the causation of what the created the cancer in the first place. So many people who are cancer survivors will tell you that their life has never been better in some way because they were shocked into having to face up and look at their experience from a totally different perspective. You're saying that we're, it's going to get worse and we're going to get shocked, but can't some of us just say, I'm shocked enough? And I'm already shocked, you know, and I'm already going to change my ways in every way I can possibly think. In fact, I'm even going to tell my friends, I'm going to tell my relatives, and, you know, in somehow a nice way. Somehow I'm going to deliver it in a way that I'm not preaching or I'm not saying they're wrong or I'm not saying I'm going to have to say it as a, this is an opportunity or, you know, I mean, the world is so full of reflection. We're all willing to be uh, loving to someone that's loving to us. But we always say, but you go first. You love me first, then I'll love you. You include me, and then I'll cl include you, because we want to reflect. And so then you're ma mean to me, and I'm mean to you, because I reflect. So, so who's going to break the reflection? You know, I mean, somebody has to step out front and say, I'm the guy, I'm your guy, let me just be more loving, more inclusive, more We open. simply have to just stop self-judging and stop judging others. Easy to say. All judgment and opinion comes from self-judgment originally. Because so we don't feel complete or we don't feel worthy enough or good enough to fully be who we are. So we judge ourselves and maybe I'm not seeing the world correctly or maybe I'm not living my life to the fullest or I'm not being loving enough or caring enough. Whatever it is that we have going on as a pattern in our consciousness is what we're going to keep recirculating through the way we live and act out our life. So it's easy to say, am I not shocked enough now? The answer to that is prob probably no. Because the shock has to impact and hit us in the heart and in the body to the very core before we'll actually make a reversal and a change in our life. Otherwise it's just a mental game we play with ourselves saying, oh, am I shocked enough at the news or world events that are happening every day? Well, people get very blasé about it. They're so used to watching it and switching it on that they just see, well, it's all just happening the way it's happening and who really cares? Who really has any control? The only way to have control is to switch off this. That's where the real control is. Or at least slow it down and stop the machine churning out the opinions and the judgments and what's wrong with the world and isn't it crazy and isn't it terrible? Well, it is what it is. 
until we stop believing in it, until we stop participating in it. And we all are past participating in it by just watching it. I watch the news most of the time, not all the time. To me, it's just pure information. But if it affects me negatively, it makes me depressed and sad, I'm not seeing God's plan clearly enough. Because God's plan for us all is to be simply at peace, to be happy, to be joyous, to be complete as I am in this moment, to give where I can, to be quiet when I feel to be quiet, to operate and do what I can do. It's humanly possible without overextending myself or getting too stressed or too burdened by what I'm taking on. We talk about the news and we're saying that, of course, the news is just some words or a verbal transmission. So then you said, watching the news, if it makes me depressed and sad, so then words can make you depressed and sad. A story that has pain in it or has injustice in it can make, can somehow activate depression or sadness. And okay, maybe that's good. I mean, it does it automatically. So but we don't really, maybe we as a people don't know what to do with depression and sadness. We don't know any creative outlet for it. And all we know is a destructive outlet, like, you know, to close off and to uh, go into some kind of a freeze mode, you know. We, you know, like an animal does a fight or a flight or a freeze. So then depression and sadness for some humans kind of freezes them up and there's nothing to live for or there's nothing to do or I can't affect anything or I, you know, I'm just a victim of everything. But if we had some kind of a schooling or coaching about what to do with that sadness. Well, that's where spiritual life comes in, Richard, because the young people of today need to be schooled in the arts of being spiritual and being a meditator. In my view, in every school around the world should have 20 minutes per week or 30 minutes per week of meditation instruction in the classrooms to give people a second option about where their life could travel. So I've spoken enough about the news, let's not go there anymore, but basically we need to be re-educated in a spiritual way, a truly spiritual way, to give children today and the new generations to come some hope that there's some way of connecting deeply with the profound nature of life, which either become, means they have to learn to become a meditator or a spiritual seeker or a, a true Christian or a, a Buddhist or whatever it is that turns them on. They have to find some way of reconnecting with their source and their nature and their love. And kids today who see nothing but unemployment cues and no future in their life could easily get depressed if they look at the state of the way the world's going. So they have to have another option, don't they? They have to be shown a different direction. Sometimes we feel like we know something about the younger generation and we want to give them whatever gifts we have to give them as far as knowledge or inspiration. But in the end, I think it's the younger generation that's going to give their gifts to us. And maybe eh, they're going to have to run the world. And it's not an easy task that we're giving them. And uh, what, do they need our tools or do they have their own tools? They have their own tools and they obviously have the gifts that they give us. But as a society, I think we're duty-bound to give them the tools of their own awakening. Because imagine people in their teenage years giving the option to learn how to be a meditator, instructed how to become a meditator. It gives them a whole different option in their life they never knew existed. Because we're at the height of our creativity in our teenage years, in our 20s and 30s particularly. We've got so much zest for life and so much energy to burn and so much creative energy just waiting to go somewhere. 
into something that's useful and spiritual and real. What better gift to give them than to at least entice them with the option of becoming a more inward creative being rather than an externally grabbing one, wanting to get life by the hands, by the scruff of the neck and wring it, wring it till it's dry. Because they want to experience. We all want to experience. And it's fair enough to want to experience. The question is, experience what? What's destined to fail and crumble? What's destined to cause us more unhappiness? Or what's destined to cause some, or the beginning of some spark of awakening? Some light, some newness, something profound, something which we can hold on to as being real. Which is what the earth represents. We've got this beautiful earth. And most people, I'd say 99% of people are more interested and focused on the world and the outcome and the experience of the world. So perhaps 2% of the population of the whole world is what I would call more truly spiritually orientated. 2%, that would be generous. Until that 2% becomes 10%, 20% or more, there's no hope for the way the world's going. No hope at all. Because From the become... beginning of our conversation, a touch word that really struck my heart was when you said the fear of your own inactivity. And it, we can teach meditation in the schools, but maybe the fear of inactivity is so rife in schools. You know, schools are teaching you all about activity and how to be prepared for every kind of event, external event. And until somehow it seems difficult to construe life that there's, there's ample time Somehow we have to share things in a different way and not just everybody garner for themselves. And the whole idea of garnering for yourself means there's no time. And inactivity is a fearful thing or a sinful thing even. Well, it's a fearful thing if it is. But <clears throat> the bizarre paradox of it all is, is to become a truly spiritually enlightened human being it requires more constant observational ability or more inner activity than one could even imagine because it's there in front of us from the moment we wake up in the morning to the moment we close our eyes and go to sleep at night we have the capacity or the ability or the opportunity to observe the human mind the conditioning of the mind the patterns of the mind the beliefs of the mind and the heart to a lesser degree so It requires immense, ongoing, vigilant activity to observe the mind and eventually come to a point of being transcendental to the mind, or to step one level beyond, beyond the mind. And that's what the awakening really is, is to see the mind for what it is, to use the mind practically when we need to, to see that we're not this mind. And not even these feelings, ultimately, although the feelings are much closer to the mark. We're not ultimately even this body, because after 80 or 90 years, this body's taken from us and given back to, the, to Mother Earth. Isn't that so? We both have an awareness here. We're sitting in awareness, both of us, and we're aware of different things, you know, what you're aware of and what I'm aware of. And some of the things you said was to notice the body, notice the thought structure, notice what's really here, notice. And I'm doing the same thing the way I'm doing it. I, maybe I'm noticing my body, my heat, my some once in a while, my breathing. And, I'm not really tuned into like 
my my heart flow right now for instance i'm noticing other things like i'm noticing the lawnmower for instance and, and noises and things but i mean there's still things i mean a lawnmower or a bird or whatever i'm noticing what's interesting to me because i'm always interested in noise in the movie right <laughs> So, but I mean, there's also the heart, or I could feel some kind. Of, I could have some kind of a feeling, like an openness. You know, a chakra activity is what, a way to call it. You know, I could could be noticing these things, but I'm just noticing what I'm noticing, and you're noticing what you're noticing, like with it, and it's effortless, right? And I'm not really trying to uh, push anything imagined. I'm not trying to imagine anything that. You know, this would be a better opening if I felt some presence here, or not just for example or whatever. You know. I'm not trying to do a spiritual number on myself and trying to say, open my chakras or, or love more. Or uh, I am very still. But I mean, sometimes in spiritual lore, we say that we should be kind of applying some technique or some kind of like trying to alter uh, our uh, the panoply of our perceptions. And I think I know where you're going with this yeah. line of speech, and <clears throat> all I can say quite strongly at this point is, <clears throat> without effort, it is impossible to awaken. I would say for 99% of people anyway. The fundamental basis of any true meditation that I'm aware of, based around breath awareness, which is where I've been trained, it's an illusion to think that we can just effortlessly walk around and be in a heightened state of consciousness without employing some technique to ground our perception and to hone our perception down where it becomes more and more still, more and more aware of whatever's arising in our consciousness in our mind this moment, the next moment, and the moment after. So some people might be able to do it through being creative or more loving or more tantric, let's say. And in my perception of being a meditation teacher, you need a technique, or everyone up to a certain point needs a technique, to ground their attention and to use a simple technique that actually works. And the technique on the earth that I'm aware of, more than any other technique that's awakened, more people on earth than any other technique for 2,500 years is Buddhist, basically, Vipassana, Buddhist meditation. Which is just simple breath awareness and secondary awareness of what's behind the breath, which is the mind, the feelings and the bodily sensations. But without breath awareness as the primary object of attention, how can you possibly still this monster of the mind that most people carry around? This active, overactive, wanting, demanding, judging, opinionated mind that most people carry to some degree or other. It's not that we don't have positive qualities, of course we do. We have a generosity and a love and a giving nature and a gentle nature, but basically we all have these qualities of the mind which are demanding our attention. So that's why we need a technique or something to utilise to get beyond what's demanding our attention. Because our thoughts are constantly demanding our attention. They're always there. If they're not there now, they're there next moment or next minute. So how do we start to process this mind, this thinking self, this mind? Through using a technique to ground our attention elsewhere, which is just, in Vipassana terms, is just a simple breath awareness. Very simple. But our mind is so incredibly active, it's very difficult to slow it down, isn't it? For most people. And once you learn to slow it down, and you can learn to pull it back by pulling back the reins on the horse, then, yes, you get to a plateau of attention or a consciousness where it doesn't need so much effort anymore, where it does become more effortless. That is so. But I've met many, many people who want to get to the effortless level of existence before they make any real effort. Not so in my experience. Not so at all. This is why most people don't have the capacity, not deeply enough, to fully awaken. 
because they're not consistent enough, they're not vigilant enough, they're not loving enough to know what they need to do. Or they're not single-pointed enough to know what they need to do. It demands tremendous energy and persistence to utilize the technique until the technique starts to take over and work its magic. And then yes, you do get to heightened states of awareness and there is more effortlessness. That's true. And even from that point, you have to move on and move up. To use an analogy. So even at great depths of awareness and your higher levels of consciousness, there's still a certain level of effort required. People may not know this, but I'm trying to explain what my experience has been. So it's extraordinarily subtle. The deeper you go into it, the more subtle and the more quick it is to perceive. Because the mind, the human mind, can move towards the speed of light. I don't know how I know that, but I know that. So how do you wind back this monster inside our head that can move at the speed of light? Because we have to bring our attention and our consciousness up to, to speed, so to speak. So we can observe the mind as it actually is, as it really occurs and arises due to its very nature. I feel very strongly about that. <laughs> well, okay, then I'll ask this question. What exactly, what is effort? What is effort? If it is single-pointed, focused attention on one thing at one time. Could you imagine anyone who becomes successful in their life? Let's say a businessman. He's driven or she's driven to do what needs to be done to become highly successful at their particular business. So they needed single-pointed, focused attention to become successful at their business. Why would anyone think that spirituality is any different? The only difference lies in looking in the other direction more profound, more everlasting direction, which is into our very heart and into our very body and into our very being. That's my definition of spiritual success, is to come to terms with looking in the right direction for long enough with a technique that's substantial enough to help us see what's in there, what needs to be recognised what needs to be seen, and eventually what needs to be transcended. Doesn't single-pointed, concentrated focus or awareness follow interest? And if you're trying to do something you're not interested in, like we say that students have attention deficit, uh, some deficiency or something, but they're not interested, so then they then that's really effort to try to focus uh, single-pointedly and for concentrated periods. But if it's something that I'm totally interested in, like maybe looking into the self or maybe a hobby or sport or maybe an activity, uh, then that effort doesn't, there seems to be no effort. In fact, I seem to get energy from uh, the more I uh, engage. So then I'm, I'm not so sure effort has some color to it where it just is there when you don't want to be there, but clearly when you, you want to be there, it's it's effortless. Clearly you have to have interest in what you're doing. In sport or in any vocation, whatever you're doing in your life, clearly you have to have interest to follow that interest to become successful. All I'm saying is, when you've lived a life of experience, particularly as we get older, we've had 40, 50 or more years on the planet to experience whatever we experience, we start to see through things as we get older as we become more mature and more deserving of knowing what we really has great meaning for us. So when we're younger, we have this tremendous instinctual creative energy to play around with. But we have many, many different interests in our life. That's true, I totally agree with you. But then when we start to see through experience and the nature of experience, that interest eventually matures and changes. And what does it change into? It has to change into something which is more profound, eventually. Well, I'm not so sure that a 
a young person is easily can easily find an interest because at least when they get to school they kind of have to fit a mold and then some people can fit that mold pretty well and they're term, term successful in school but some people rebel against that mold for life for long times and so they never I think there's so many people that have never found their interest all I'm saying is unless you have an interest in spirituality or meditation or the inner life or life however we deem it to be clearly life demands that we come to life eventually in some way or other whether through creativity whether through sexuality whether through love whether through vipassana whatever it is that turns us on is where our interest has to lie until our interest changes and develops into something else which relates or enhances our current interest wherever we are. Some people are more in tune with love, for example. They don't really want to be a meditator. And who am I to say they should become a meditator? If love does it for them and that sparks their creative fire and brings them to life, fantastic. But the interest has to be genuine, that's all I'm saying. Unless there's a genuine interest, you'll never travel very far in any vocation or any area of our life, we can't, because interest is what motivates us, and what motivates us is what takes us down the road of life, isn't it? Yes, but I mean, we have to experiment with interest too, because then the media will tell us, oh, this is the greatest, you know, be interested in this, and then we try it and we say, oh, well, you know, that didn't last very long, and so then I guess we have to make mistakes about what's interesting. We're born to make mistakes, we're born to experience life to the full, so we're born to experience the the polarity of life, the positive and the negative, aren't we? And eventually we see that if we follow the positive or the negative or a combination of both, it ends up entangling us on some level of unhappiness again. Because what we thought was positive and what we were driven towards maybe turned out but maybe didn't turn out and we got upset and angry and, up and frustrated. And if we go down the negative road, well most people know where the negative road leads, it leads to depression and despair and unhappiness which is more directly obvious. So we're on the seesaw of life, we're all on the seesaw of life going up and down, positive experiences, negative experiences, here, there and everywhere. But eventually we're trying to find that fulcrum point, that stillness, that quality where we can just stand still and look with amazement at the whole complexity and the whole search and the whole human conditioning and the whole human dilemma that exists on the planet today. That we're all individually a part of. We're all adding to the collective level of awareness or lack of awareness around the world. We're all contributing in, in some way in our own life. We just acknowledge the seesaw of life. So then we say, okay, you know, there's somehow positive feelings and negative feelings. There's expansion and contraction. There's some kind of... Um, tension and release or anxiety and joy you know and then now then we're saying you said well if you could find that fulcrum point you know but I'm saying like okay when we're going up and down we're trying to actually narrow the focus and say can I just be on the upside why what's the down part and you're suggesting that maybe the the fulcrum is as a balance point that you can see both sides but could we possibly have a wider context where just the human experience was known to be ups and downs and uh, that uh, that's the only way we can see things because there's a contrast there and then we could celebrate the downs and the ups. I don't know. I mean, I'm just wondering because well, the moment you say I want to be on the fulcrum, you'll just the first thing you notice is, but I'm not there now. And then that's already throwing you more toward the, the down part because you're saying, oh, it didn't work out today, you know, something, this is a bad day, right, on the fulcrum. So then I slid down. But if you were saying that actually life is the whole teeter-totter. Well, that is, it clearly is the whole theater, but basically whatever part of the seesaw we're on is leading us to confront or observe our direct experience in the now, in the now, in the now. So it doesn't matter whether we're heading towards this direction or that direction. They're all tipping us towards the same realization. 
eventually because the whole story of our life is an up and a down, isn't it, for most people? Because we follow the ups and downs because we're compelled or driven to follow the ups and downs because we want to be successful. And because we want to be successful, we're unconsciously, through the polarity of existence, creating the fact that we might lose or we might be unsuccessful or disappointed or upset. So we're looking eventually as meditators or as spiritual beings or as newcoming spiritual beings, let's say, we're looking for a place where we can rest. And that's how my own describing what the fulcrum is. The fulcrum is standing in the middle, enjoying standing in the middle, and when the ups and downs come, go for the ride, but realise the ride's not it. Reads the ride's part of it, but it's not all of it. Because the ride is the momentum I was speaking about earlier. Well, we're in the ride and we're in the momentum, we tend to think we're going somewhere towards success or lack of success, towards profit or towards loss, towards elation or towards depression. They're all two forms of the same thing or a similar thing. I asked you a moment ago what is effort and we had a good discussion about that, you know, but I think I wouldn't be complete if I didn't ask you what is effortless. Effortless is when the momentum and the search stops and we're just left in the awesomeness and the amazement of just being freed from the whole dilemma, which is really a description of enlightenment. It's an effortless, uninterrupted perception that everything is perfectly good this moment and forever. That's effortlessness. Many people have relative experiences of effortlessness in many different areas of their life. Maybe when they're learning music, they find it hard for a while, and then they get into an effortless stage where their fingers just learn quite easily. So there's different levels of effortlessness in any experiential field at all. Even in sports, right? Because they of call it in, in the zone. Of course, in sports. Sports takes focused attention. To be good at, good at sport, whatever sport it is, you have to be focused. You have to train your body to be there, to perform in a certain way. Now, I have great admiration for famous sports people or very proficient sports people because they have to use a lot of focus and effort to attain whatever degree of success that they attain. It's an active form of meditation, sport or gymnastics or swimming, anything is a form of meditation if you look at it, if you boil it down. You know, we think about uh, physical when we say sports or activities like that, but actually any kind of performance puts us more on the edge. But it's so easy to live a whole life and never be on the edge where you, you could, because with performance and when you're on the edge, you can measure, right? With sports, you get points or you have times or, uh, and you can see. But with life, you kind of just lived in the middle road and just, it's just not real obvious that, you know, we don't, and without getting into some kind of a performance. Uh, because life can't be measured, you see. Real life can't be measured because it's so unknowable. When we're in the moment and we're just still, how can we possibly know anything other than just the stillness we're experiencing now? In the spiritual life, the ego can get involved and say, I'm, I'm awakened and I'm more awakened than someone else, and then we get into self-judgments and judgments of others and a whole spiritual ego game can take place and people can become very stuck and very lost in the spiritual ego game. But when you're truly free and liberated from your own bondage and your own mentality and your own emotionality, your ego lays down before you and says, I've had enough, I surrender. In those moments where it's willing to just die and let go and let you be free for a while until, or if it, the tendency of it wants to come back, which it does again and again and again and again over a period of time until it eventually relaxes and says, okay, you're the master. <laughs> I'll let you be. When you spoke of effortlessness, then you said it's being in the amazement. 
you know, use the word amazement. And so being amazed, that means like I didn't think it was going to be that way. It was just a surprise. And so then amazement or surprise means that I didn't know. And so somehow it seems like effortlessness has to do with not knowing. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. And living in a mystery. Being, will, being good with that, you know, not knowing is not creating nervousness, but it's just creating mystery and love. Well, you use the right word. It is a mystery. It is a mystery. It's a mystery to be lived every moment. And I, I want to distinguish that from saying mystify, you know, try to mystify and make stuff covered and esoteric. I'm not saying that. But... Well, churches and teachers and teachings who are, who are who they are love to mystify because that's how they can make a vocation of it. You see? Someone who's really telling the truth all of the time can't mystify it. They can just say how incredibly simple and beautiful it is, but they can never mystify it. Because mystifying it is putting a veil over it. So that's so. We talked at one pointed effort and finding certain practices or certain, you know, in the moment you said breath work, then I could feel my nostrils, right? <laughs> but uh, uh, well, I think we both know masters that have not created, they, they do what they say, create a device. And a device, I think, it, to me, it's like a trick, right? Where it somehow backs you into something. And you think you're going forward and putting one po pointed uh, effort and uh, consciousness on, on something that, in, in the end, you just find yourself appearing in another state, and you don't know what hit you or how you got there. And it probably wasn't by mm, what you thought was your forward motion. But what what is a device? I mean, I think you know what I'm talking about. Well, you only know about. the truth of a device by actually employing it and doing it. For example, if you do a retreat like a Buddhist retreat, and you last 10 days or as long as you last in the retreat, and you come out after 10 days, you'll know whether they, what you employed did you any good. They may have confronted you with feelings and thoughts which you didn't want to look at. They may be true. It also would have enlivened you and grounded you and made you still enough to start to see parts of yourself that you'd never previously seen. And so you only know whether a technique is valuable or useful if you employ it. Surely. It's like learning to play the piano. If you didn't learn a technique or have a teacher to teach you how to play the piano, you wouldn't know whether it was useful. It's the same. So by employing something, you actually see the truth of it or you see through it. And you see it wasn't for you. That technique or that whatever you did wasn't useful, perhaps. But for me, every time I went and did a retreat, even though it put me through quite a lot, it was a journey of pleasure and pain for me, every retreat I ever did. It was a balance between having pleasurable experiences and painful ones. After I came out of every retreat I ever did, I felt psychically different, more open, more fragile, more aware, more sharp, more here, literally. So I knew it worked. It was very obvious that it worked. But I had to go there to find out. I think everyone that falls into this website and sees these videos has probably put it, put effort in what they call effort into doing retreats or thinking about their own life or. Um, researching or attending meetings or having one-on-one -on -one sessions and, and as a result of these efforts I think they all get some kind of a release right but yet it seems like it's a, an experience that comes and goes and it really isn't a long-lasting effect because here we are 10 20 30 years later doing the same thing going to satsangs and going uh, and just saying, well, we like the people there, we like the sangha, 
first. And the teachers are answering a lot of the same questions, too, for maybe other people, you know. Because spiritual life, I don't want to cut you off there, yeah, spiritual life for many people has become some level of bizarre entertainment, in my view. That sounds terribly judgmental, I know, but it's just who I am. Spirituality is not some form of entertainment. And every guru I've ever had, including my first one, Osho, all got into some level of entertainment with people. It's not about entertainment. It's got nothing to do with entertainment whatsoever. It's about having love for your teacher, whoever your teacher is, trusting your teacher, listening to the instructions of your teacher, and putting your own mind and body on the line to investigate what the teachers explain to you. You only need one teacher, only one. I know many people around the world are probably on their twelfth teacher by now. You only need one. One that will tell you the truth, keep pointing out the truth, keep giving you feedback about what you experience when you go into the truth, and that's all you need, one. We'll be honest with you. We'll be direct and frank with you and keep feeding back what you need to look at now. And many people go to spiritual groups for the social entertainment and the social togetherness, and they certainly have a love of a guru. There's no question. The question is their love of the guru, whoever the guru is. But the guru is not going to do it for you. You're the one that's going to do it, ultimately. The guru will guide you only. I will give some level of instruction, but you're the one who has to do it. Having said that, you definitely, up to a certain point, need a teacher to give you feedback. To say to you, yes, the experience you're having currently as you meditate is true. It's all right. Keep going. Keep looking. Keep investigating the path, whatever that path is. I gave a couple examples in the beginning. I think I said something like, uh, sometimes I find a stillness just in conversation. And then we started talking about without effort or without a teacher or without a practice. Or, and I won't go back to that. But, I mean, we were saying that it'll never happen, maybe. And yet, like we talked about effort and effortlessness. And... And I talked about effort and said that the results of effort are obvious, but they, it comes and goes. Of course, everything maybe comes and goes. But, for instance, our viewers can't really look you directly in the eye like I am because the cameras are offset. And I wish I could solve that problem because, wow, it's really something else over here on this seat. <laughs> Well, I'm finding that. Problem, that I'm just say this, though. I'm just say, yeah, you could, but I mean, just I'll say, say maybe you should too, because I'll say this: that it's effortless. That stillness is effortless in this hour. You know, just sitting across from you and I, and because just we're knowing. holding our attention together. So yeah. we're sharing something which is meaningful, and you're holding my attention, and I'm holding your attention by answering you, and we're going back and forth. So and it's a play of attention. Of course. Because this is totally effortless. And I'm not saying it won't come and go, but I mean, okay, for instance, let me say like this. Um, I used to do retreats and I'd love to go to these beautiful places high in a mountain overlooking the sea. And, and then I went on this one retreat and they were holding it in a strip mall and it was next to a dry cleaner. <laughs> and I thought, whoa. Why are they doing that? Because it actually was in La Jolla, California. It's a beautiful place. And uh, then when I got out of that retreat, I realized that I'm already home and in the city, you know, and this can't be shaped. Whatever I have here can't be taken away from me. But the fact that I'm at a, a beautiful retreat center on the ocean front or something, then I think, oh, I have to go back there. So then if I'm doing effort, sure, I get somewhere, I get things. But then I always associate that with the effort, and I and I deprive myself of it if I'm not making. And this is just a question. Maybe I'm saying 
saying it like a statement, but uh, I mean, here, okay, I'm just sitting with you and effortlessly there's a great stillness and questions seem to come up that I don't know if they're brilliant or you know, I'll look at it later and see if, but it seemed like we're having a great discussion and uh, it's being born out of a more authentic place than many times the way I speak. And uh, I think that's the effort. what you find in effortlessness must be very powerful and, and maybe just as powerful as what you find through effort. That's my question, I guess. Well, if you get to a level of effortlessness, whatever level that is, you've deserved it. That's all I can tell you. It's not a freebie. It's not mm -hmm. a free ride. People might think it's a free ride. It's not a free ride. There's karmic circumstance and destiny involved with you wanting to be a special being. And there's repercussions. And there's confrontations and there's resistance and there's fear and there's anxiety and there's bliss and there's peace and there's pleasure. There's a whole syndrome of different experiences locked up inside our psyche and it's inside our brain. And whether we employ effort or we look for the effortless version, we're still going to go through what we go through to find whatever we find, aren't we? So does it really matter whether you find it through this method or that? Not really. The important point is that you get there. You arrive to your satisfaction and to your completeness. So maybe we should say don't give up. I would definitely say don't give up. So that means try effort and then try effortlessness too, you know, and try everything in between and just keep at it because what else is more interesting? Well, and the whole world's into effortlessness. I mean, look at the hotels and pubs around the world and the people smoking marijuana. There's a whole journey into being effortless if you want to be effortless and changes your brain chemistry. <laughs> I'm not trying well, to be gross here, yeah. but... Right, but I mean, even probably meditation changes your brain chemistry and probably enlightenment changes your brain chemistry it does. too, right? It does. So then you can't blame that. What know? I'm saying is most people have tried the easy road. The easy road is right. only temporary. Yeah. That's well, all. you got to go get a job and buy some marijuana, right? <laughs> it's not totally after this. <laughs> well, you know what I'm saying. I mean, yeah, I know what you're saying. People are looking for an instant hit, an instant right. glimpse, an instant something or other. And... The depth of enlightenment is certainly not instant, although you have glimpses over many, many years. And it's not about the glimpses, it's about the destination mm -hmm. eventually, isn't it? I think you get something out of drugs too, because like, um, you know, my, I'm not really very experienced, but in my experiences, I learned that life was could be playful, right? And that's already really a big one, right? And For then, somebody that's all serious, serious dudes. <laughs> in that sense, nothing's not positive in the true sense because whatever we have to do to learn from is what we have to do and drugs for many people back in the 60s and 70s in my generation and yours was a way into the psychedelic psychedelic revolution which changed people's way of looking at the world so it had to be good in one level having said that there were many people who suffered very severely by overdoing the drugs and taking on too many chemicals on board their body and Possibly well, the they point. stopped right there. They stopped there and said, okay, I think you could stop there even in spiritual growth. You could just stop and, you know, maybe like you said, because uh, effortlessness was amazement, you know, and the moment you stop being amazed by your spiritual growth, you've arrived at a plateau that you're trying to state the truth or something like that, right? And as long as you're amazed, you're still not knowing and you're still in the mystery and you're still discovering. That's right. I can't add much more to that. That's correct. It's what anchors you into being here. Every moment, not just some moments. Everyone's in the, in the presence of being for some time. But then they lose it. And their mind overrides their attention and they're off into imagination or dreamland again. That's all. Enlightenment is, is just for a search to find something which is eternally present all of the time. It never leaves. Because the mind weaves all over the place and comes and goes and weaves here and there. 
And that's part of the experiential journey, but that's not it. Let's say a few words about, you know, okay, you said enlightenment never leaves, but yet it seems like it does. So then what's here must appear very subtle. So we should look in the very subtle movements and the very subtle perceptions, perhaps. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm asking, you know, how can something be never leave, always here, and yet we're trotting over it unless it's very subtle? Because unless you use a technique like I was saying before, in my experience at least, you can't actually get to seeing what is the subtle behind everything. You can't see the mind unless you're grounded enough in your body to be able to have a springboard from which you can perceive or understand the mind or see the mind clearly because it moves at the speed of light or approximating the speed of light. So unless you're standing on the springboard, you've got no chance of diving into the pool, have you? People just think they are. Yeah. I don't know. Do we dive in the pool or do we just fall in? <laughs> well, both. 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 We fall in and we have bad experiences or we have confusion or delusional experiences sometimes. And sometimes we dive in consciously and we're there for a while. Yeah. No, until we're notion, distracted again. Uh, my notion is we try to stay out of that pool no matter what. <laughs> just get close and pretend. Well, that's how a lot of people experience it, I'm sure. I could tell you a little story there, but it's probably not appropriate. Because we just touched on drugs a moment ago. I'll tell you a little story. Let me just say this and and put this in, in with the story, you know, because uh, there's shamans that have this ayahuasca and all that other stuff, you know, which I'm not really attracted to and I've never liked to say it to our audience because then I think someone's going to go out there and take a bunch of drugs if we start saying it. But, I mean, there's that too. So then just tell your story and then if there's something you can add for that. Well, in Pune, this is back in the early days, a long time ago, back in the um, mid-70s or late 70s, they had these wells in Pune. Everyone used to swim in the wells when it was hot. One day a friend of mine came up to me and it was on sunset and it was a beautiful still day and he offered me a puff of a joint and I hadn't had a joint for some time and I thought, okay, I used to do this some years before, so why not? And I had a couple of puffs of this joint and I just fell backwards into the well. And was wallowing in the water and lying on my back like a big porpoise and having a great time. And, and I had a profound temporary awakening. Obviously the drugs induced the awakening. And I was so moved by the awakening, which lasted for some days, I wrote to Osho and told him about the experience and described what had happened to me. And he wrote back in his own handwriting with a very simple one-sentence statement, drugs is the mind. I thought that was very quaint. What else could he say? I love it. You know, because you answered my question about ayahuasca. Totally. It's all the mind, but the chemicals definitely induce higher states of consciousness or different states of consciousness in our brain. There's no question about that. But it doesn't last, does it? Maybe. What, by that sentence, did he mean that something else wasn't the mind? But I'm wondering if everything's it's the mind. It's pure and simple. Drug is the mind. Yeah. So the awakening or whatever it was I thought I experienced was my imagination. <laughs> I don't know why I told you that. It's probably not yeah. appropriate, but... No, it's fine. Good story. Right. Oh, I like that one a lot. Let me show your book. It's called The Secret of Eternity. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, it came to me quite powerfully over a period of time that there was a lot of confusion in spiritual life about reality versus the world. And the basic endeavour or the motivation I had to write the book was to describe the difference between absolute and relative reality. Now, ultimately, reality is one. We all know that. It's non-dualistic. It's perfect. It's mysterious. It's unknowable. 
this is absolute reality, which is what enlightenment is. So I've definitely described that in there in my own way. But I've also described relative reality and explained or tried to explain the difference between how we get caught up in relative reality, which is more where the new age people are, wanting to create our own reality and all that kind of thing, and our thoughts create our destiny and our reality. Well, there's some level of truth to that, but it's not the actual truth, is it? So the book was an explanation or an attempt to discern the difference between the dualistic world, the personal self world, that we create our experience and we create our reality up to a point we do. The new ages are half right. They haven't got the whole story, that's all. Which we can't create now, can we? Now is eternally given. Now is eternally who we are, enough said. So we can dip our feet into both worlds if we want. We can play around with the dualistic world, with creation and destruction, or we can stay attuned and sensitized to the absolute world, which is the world of peace and perfection. Always comes back to now, doesn't it? And obviously we tend to oscillate between the two to some degree, depending on how much we're involved with the world. We have to deal with both realities, like a juggling act, really. Because the relative world can easily pull us back out of the absolute if we're not careful. So we got to be in both worlds at once. Absolutely. Of course, it's only one world, but only one world. But we have to have one foot in each world whilst we're in operation. If we're operating in the world and we're using a computer. We have to think about how to use the computer. We're in a state of samadhi and bliss and meditation. We don't need to remember anything. We don't need to think about anything. We're just there. This is the dual, dualistic world. What's necessary in one world doesn't work in the other. And vice versa. So it's like trying, learning how to switch a light on and off. For me, I'm not very good on the computer. I can do basic things on the computer, very basic things. Luckily and graciously for me, my partner does some of the computer work or most of the computer work. So that saves me having to become all mental to learn about something I don't really want to learn about. Well, I'm forced to up to a certain point. You see, so the computing world or the world of computers and technology is a mental world. It's not my world. It's a mental world that creates a service and a possibility that we can reach people on the other side of the planet through videos and interviews like this, but so it has its purpose. But for me, it doesn't interest me really. Not the computerized world. Because I'm not really mentally focused or equipped to deal with it. A little bit, but just as much as necessary. It doesn't interest me. We were talking before about interest. It doesn't interest me. Well, it interests many people. Yeah, it doesn't interest you. You know, I guess I... I use that as an example a lot, actually, about a computer. I'm not a technical person. People say I'm not a technical person. Well, now you're saying that that's a mental realm, and I'm, I'm a heart person, or I'm a stillness person, or... Um, I'm having a period in the vastness. I can feel that. But somehow, I don't know, also, it's a definition also, you know, that even that the mental would cancel the vastness somehow. And I don't know, I've been not believing too much in that people that say I'm not a computer person, but we all need to mentor each other on computers, that's for sure, because it's so so much things that you can spend so much time there. You don't want to spend that much time doing that, right? You want to just oh, I don't. sit Many and rest. Many people do. Yeah. No, I want to spend time on computers doing things, but I don't want to spend time being stuck. 
and right. trying to work out, well, what's this very simple thing that nobody ever told me? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's probably it. Well, the secret of eternity sounds totally fascinating. I think we talked about things like this right in our discussion, but uh, now I get a chance to read it. <laughs> secret well, I've of eternity. Been enjoying it. I've enjoyed it. It's only yeah. a small book, but it says a lot. And I have two other books coming. They're basically written, but they need to be redone and re-edited. There's two other bigger books following. One is my personal story, my autobiography, which was the original book, which a friend of ours read, and she said it really should become two books, and it actually became three. And this is the smallest book. The other two are coming down the pipeline. Thank you, Peter, for paying this visit to us. I really, really enjoyed. Maybe you can uh, show people, uh, gaze into the camera a second and show people My what pleasure. I've been My pleasure to speak to you. And whomever this video reaches, it's destined to reach, and I hope it gives some people a glimpse of something. Because the enlightening journey is an amazing thing, and it's well worth pursuing in my experience, in my view. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you for, for following us in Australia. And we've only just begun, so fantastic start. So thank you all. <laughs>